And now we shall unite our voices to sing our theme songs. And uh, the theme song is also present in the program sheet on the back of it, so you can see it or uh, yeah. We shall sing the theme song once more. And uh, right now we're having te technical issues, so unfortunately we can't uh, put the screen up there. But I'm sure you guys might be having uh, the program sheet, so we can all look it up from the back of the book and uh, join together in singing. All right. for joining us for singing. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the afternoon session for our PCM Congress. 
um, we had a wonderful session in the morning. And uh, as we continue into the afternoon, I'm sure we'll have some more um, great things to learn. For our prayer, I would like to invite Pastor Andrew. Shall we all stand for our opening prayer before we begin our afternoon session? Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to learn. May we open our hearts, open our minds as we uh, equip ourselves through the lessons that we'll be learning here in the symposium, in the lectures, and also our meetings here and presentations. May we be with each presenter. May you speak through them. May it be a blessing for us that we can uh, draw closer to you and implement all the things that we learn. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We shall have an interview with the ECD PCM Director, the East Central African Division PCM Director. Uh, it will be hosted by Dr. Ravindra Shankar, who is the Field Secretary and the PCM Coordinator for the Southern Asia Division. Good afternoon to each one of you, the offline as well as online viewers. When we had the PCM Council to organize the PCM Congress, one of the suggestions that came was to interview one or two PCM directors of the other division and get to know what is happening in the other division so that that will be an inspiration to our division or as well as to the PCM directors of our unions as well as conferences and sections. So, with reference to that, we were able to contact uh, two of the, the PCM directors of the other divisions. Uh, the PCM director of South American Division, uh, Brother Carlos, as well as uh, the East Central Africa Division, uh, PCM director, youth director, Pastor Mogalilo. Unfortunately, the uh, brother... Carlos is not going to be here because of various uh, engagements, but we are happy to have uh, uh, Pastor Mogalilo. Uh, he will be on the screen very soon. And he is the youth director as well as the PCM director, the music uh, coordination committee director for Southern Asia, uh, sorry, for East Central Africa Division, situated, headquarters situated at Nairobi, Kenya. Of course, he is a good friend of mine and uh, he had been uh, working in the organization for the last uh, nearly three decades. And uh, of course, we worked together as the youth directors. When I was a youth director in the Southern Asia Division, he was the, he was the youth director in the East Central Africa Division. Then he moved, moved on to the uh, North Tanzanian Union President. Then he came back as the youth director of uh, East Central Africa Division. And uh, right now, he is the PCM director as well as U director of ECD. We are going to have him on the screen very soon. And uh, we, we, we will get to know what is happening in the other divisions. Yes, you can see Pastor Mogalilo is the youth director as well as PCM director of 
East Central Africa Division. We want to welcome you, Pastor Mogalilo. Nice to see you in the uniform there. And uh, we were waiting for you. And uh, we want to welcome you for this Youth Congress. Uh, sorry, PCM Youth Congress, rather, I should say. And, uh, and I'm going to ask you a few questions. Get to know what is happening as far as PCM uh, department is concerned in your, uh, in your division. I would like to know how many PCM chapters are there in your division? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, my friend. I'm happy to be here and thank you for inviting me to be part of this important uh, event. Um, uh, in the East Central Africa Division, uh, we have uh, at least 200. 200 chapters that is to say uh, we have more than 200 we we have a challenge of getting the specific uh, specific statistics but uh, we we know that it is not less than 200 chapters uh, uh, all over our division thank you and uh, i want to i want to let you know that uh, we have uh, nearly 2000 uh, young people from African continent studying in India, in various universities in India. And they are from mostly, majority of them are from Central East, Central Africa. Majority of them from Kenya, I see from Tanzania, then uh, Nairobi, that is Tanzania, that is Kenya. Then we have uh, Burundi, we have people from uh, Uganda, Nigeria, and also Botswana. A lot of people are from this area studying in India and that is nearly about 2,000. You know, that is a remarkable number. They are all studying in public campuses. And uh, recently I met about uh, 35 to 40 people in one particular city. Most of them are uh, doing pharm pharmacy program. Another city from here about uh, a few hundred kilometers that is uh, Baroda about another 30, 40 are there. Most of them are doing law course there. So they have a three different, uh, uh, I should say, associations. And there is an association called ISA, A I A A S A, S A. That is All India Advent African Adventist Students Association. And they have uh, three unions, that is Southern Union, Central Union, as well as Northern Union. So once a year, uh, these unions, they have their camp meeting in different parts of India. And uh, they, are, they have been here for the last, or this association has been existing for the last 26 years or so, I understand, 26 years. That means from last 26 years, uh, we have been seeing the African students coming to India and studying. And I understand even there were a lot of African students studying in uh, in this uh, university called Spicer Adventist Student Adventist University. Right now there are quite a few studying in this university and I would like to say that one to you. So, and you have, uh, you should know this one, that majority are there, are, uh, majority of them are from your division. That's very impressive, uh, uh, Ravindra. And uh, that's very, 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 it's, it's important to, to know that India has been uh, uh, a destination, a destination of uh, many of our students, uh, not only students, but uh, uh, from times memorial, even the pastors, the ministers, the, the accountants, and uh, many workers who are working in the church, they, they went through uh, Spicer Memorial College, uh, and and uh, now you are mentioning about the public campus ministries. So we are happy to learn that they are there. And uh, thank you so much for um, the, the the way you are taking care of them, the way you are ministering them. They don't feel that they are missing the pastoral care that their fellow students are getting, uh, those who are studying in our uh, universities back home. Thank you and congratulations for the good work you're doing for our, our young people there. Thank you. And a uh, few more questions, uh, Pastor Mogalilo. Uh, do you have Amicus Adventist Ministry for college and university students in your division? 
Um, now, uh, maybe Dr. Raven Glyer, let me let me explain this a little bit. That our our structure, we, it may not be very different from yours, but um, uh, Amicus and PCM, we we are approaching them in a in a in in a unique way. Uh, when we want to bring together our students, um, college and university students. And uh, in this category, we have added the high school because of the 16 years old and above. When we want to bring them together, those who are attending the public schools and those who are attending the church schools or private schools, church universities or private universities, once in a while, we bring them together. They uh, come under the umbrella of Amicus, Adventist Ministries to College and University Students. But when we want to focus on those who are attending the public, public uh, uh, universities, then we go with the, with the flag of PCM. So all those are going together and uh, under Amicus and under PCM, they are students associations. So we don't have a group we call these students are Amicus or this is students are PCM. Um, those are ministries, just like as we have Adventist Youth Ministries and under it we have Pathfinder, Adventurer, Ambassador. That's how we treat this. We have PCM and we have we have we have Amicus, and under them we have association. Like here in Kenya, we have Kukasa, uh, Kenya University and College Adventist Student Association. In Tanzania, we have Tukasa, Tanzania University and, uh, and College Adventist Students Association. In Uganda, again, we have Yukasa. In, in different countries, we have those different. Uh, associations but when we bring public campus by themselves we use the flag of pcm and when we we bring those who are attending in church universities together with those who are attending with public universities then we have amicus so with that yes we have amicus as the ministry that is ministering to both um, uh, all Adventist students, regardless of which university they attend, whether it's public, whether it's uh, it's private, whether it's it's a denominational, all of them when they come together, it's the umbrella of Amicus that is covering them. So we have Amicus. Good, that is quite interesting. I would like to know what are the initiatives that you have taken to cater to the needs of. Uh, the public campus ministry students. I know that there are hundreds and thousands of students are studying in uh, public campuses in your division. And how do you address their needs? And how do you address their challenges? Do you have, what are your initiatives? Thank you, thank you so much, uh, my, my, my brother. Um, we, we really have actually hundreds of thousands of students in these universities. In the region, in the East Central Africa region, we have 11 countries actually, and we have 12 entities, unions and uh, uh, administrative units. And each one of these, they, they have a number of universities. In total, we have more, way more than 400 um, uh, public universities in uh, in in our region. We we have more than four hundred universities in our region, and we have so many schools. Uh, I mean, universities like here in Kenya, one actually which could be having the largest population is um, Kenyatta University. And Kenyatta University, we are talking of more than three thousand Seventh Day Adventist students congregating every Sabbath, more than 3,000, all of them congregating when you go there every Sabbath. And this took even the initiative of the university. This is a public university belonging to, to the government of Kenya. Uh, the government has been so gracious. They even employed 
they they worked with us to identify a seventh adventist chaplain and the government is paying that chaplain and 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 so to, to take care of this big number of seventh adventists so there's no question we have a huge number of our uh, adventists attending these public universities and the first the first initiative the first is initiative that we have taken and we are still taking is to put them under these associations because we have realized uh, if we wanted to supply pastors in every each each and every of these campuses then we will close all the, the, the we will remove all the pastors from the, the churches the campuses are so many and so what we are doing is to organize them to pastor themselves to pastor each other and have one pastor who oversees a number of campuses so we organize them under these associations which have missed, uh, i've mentioned to casa ukasa uh, kukasa and all of those and for secondary school also they have their own uh, um uh, you know type of association so we we put them there and we have their constitution and they put their leadership there and we have a pastor who is taking care of several campuses uh, that way he goes and makes sure they have done the election and they are leading uh, themselves so that is um, themselves organizing themselves number two is to give them chaplains and this one is also um one of our 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 our, our uh, 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 we, we are in, in, we have in, in that intentionality of making sure that we get the best the best of pastors to assign them as pastors intentionally we don't leave it to happen just like that and when they have these good pastors they lead them very well and the third and maybe the last major one is uh, now we are starting it has not advanced much but we are starting to assign local churches and this is after the coming of pcm pcm have been a big blessing especially now that it has gone all the way to local churches according to our church manual so we are challenging local churches which are located nearby this public universities or private universities which are non-adventists to adopt that institution and for those who have started it is working very well so if this is the local church a and there is a university x so this local church adopts all the adventists who are attending in this university and that way church services local church services are able to reach these students lord's supper baptism um preaching visitation seminars and sometimes they are invited to come especially the boarding um schools the universities that are boarding so those three things are our major major initiative organize them in association give them uh, good chaplains intentional intentional and the third one we organize local churches to adopt the students who are near nearby the the local churches and we praise god we see uh, things are moving on but we still see the need is bigger than what we are trying to do Lord, that, is, that is quite interesting it is a very good uh, initiative a very good move that you have adopted in your division to who these uh, uh, PCM students who are studying in various advent various non-adventist universities. You have told me that you have more than 200 uh, PCM chapters in your uh, division. Approximately how many students are there in, in each of these chapters approximately? Yeah, so if we take um, the average, average number, the, it fluctuates. As I said, like Kenyatta University, we are talking about over 3,000. There was a time there were 4,000 uh, going to 5,000. Many of these campuses, they are having 1,000 of them. 
but there are some small, small campuses that are having 100. There are some small which are having 50. So the, the, the number vary, the variation is it's, it's very huge and, and maybe an average can be very much misleading. But, but with that picture, you can imagine that many of the universities in the cities, they have our, 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 our young people, Adventist young people attending to them in terms of hundreds and some in terms of thousands, of course, few of those in terms of thousands and some few in, in terms of uh, tens. But the majority are 500, uh, 600, 800. And so uh, if we want to take an average, maybe 500 there, five, 600 uh, can give us um, a little picture. So, so as, I, as per your uh, talk, if I can visualize that you have more than 20,000 PCM students studying in various non adventist universities in your division. Definitely, definitely. Yes. Yeah. So that is a remarkable number, I should say that. It's a remarkable number. And uh, I know that uh, youth ministry has been a very strong ministry in your division. I know we have talked to one another face-to-face -face or one-to-one -one whenever we met each other in various conferences, advisories. And uh, we know that your Pathfinder, Pathfinder program is a very strong program. And I come to know that your PCM program is also a very strong program now. And... Uh, it is something uh, to be appreciate, something to be appreciated, and uh, really remarkable. And uh, I hope that uh, we have taken note of the uh, the uh, the initiatives that you have that you have taken up in your division, and uh, we'll try to adopt the same thing in our uh, division too. And we will try to take up this one in our advisories and try to promote whatever that you are doing in your division in our division too, in our unions, in our sections and conferences. And thank you very much, uh, Pastor Mogalilo. Thank you very much for taking time to come to our, uh, uh, the PCM Congress, at least online. And I have been requesting you to visit uh, India, uh, to Southern Asia to address and meet with uh, your own uh, students or your own countrymen who are studying in India. I hope that day, that day will come very soon. I am looking forward and, and, and thank you. You visited us uh, some few years ago yes. and uh, uh, unfortunately our schedule did not work together, but thank you and come again. Come again, we can plan and put our schedule together and um, uh, one of these days we should be visiting. Thank you so much for inviting us and you also welcome. Welcome to, to our division. We need to learn from what you're doing and congratulations for this uh, powerful uh, virtual international PCM Congress. Thank you so much. God bless your ministry. God bless your family too. And uh, may God uh, uh, take care of yourself and uh, we'll see you very soon, maybe in person. God bless you. Now we will move on to the next part of the program. I'll invite the, the MCs to come and take over. Now we're going to have the symposium. The topic of the symposium is Methods of Attracting Young People to Adventist Education. The chairman for this will be Dr. M. Wilson, who is the Executive Secretary of the Southern Asia Division. The members of the symposium shall be Dr. Samuel Gaikwad, Dr. Prima Gaikwad, Pastor Binoy Tirki, who is the Youth Director of the Southern Asia Division, uh, Mr. Rajesh Chand, the Education Director of the Northern India Union, and Dr. Paul Bhagin, who is the Vice Chancellor at Northeast Adventist University. May we all be blessed.
good afternoon brothers and sisters this is a very warm afternoon actually the sun is very angry outside <laughs> uh, i do not know people watching from different parts of india perhaps nepal and bhutan maybe you are also experiencing the heat but this afternoon we have very important topic to discuss and we have very special people also so i'm sure you will gain some valuable um information thoughts from this presentation we have been waiting we prepared and i'm sure this will be a great blessing um as we as we open this we have one hour i do not know we are running short little bit but we will try to not to take it is uh, 3:30 uh, we will complete by 4:30 or little less and uh, as we begin may i request dr samuel gaikwad to offer a word of prayer let's pray together our eternal god heavenly father we thank you lord for your bountiful blessings though it is warm our hearts are warm also and because holy spirit is among us we know that each one of us will be richly blessed because your blessings are resting upon us now as we discuss an important topic may each one of us and all our pcm members be blessed wherever they are and listening to us keep us faithful to you in our discussion and may our thoughts always direct to jesus christ our savior we pray in jesus name amen the topic before us this afternoon is methods or we can say avenues to attract young people to adventist education i repeat in case you especially those who are online if you did not receive the program the topic we are discussing is methods or avenues or strategies on how to attract young people to adventist education very very important topic and we have very important people and uh, before i get into the topic i want to introduce the panel members to my right i have uh, pastor binoy tirki he is the youth director he has been an education man for many years in fact he served the church for 35 years and mostly in the education ministry i admired his leadership when we had the northern india union constituency he was the boarding school principal very well organized very skilled person after him uh, to my extreme uh, right is uh, brother rajesh chand at presently is the northern india union education director i think you have about 25 to 20 schools you have mic 23 schools and um, this is a very widely spread territory of 14 states of hindi speaking belt he is a he is in charge of a large territory and he has a big job to do and he has put in uh, 30 years of service we want to welcome you to my left i am really privileged i mean these are the I can say gift for southern asia from the lord almighty i can daringly very proudly say we do not have many iscs going from southern asia territory to go to other divisions and serve and bring pride to our division and just a few weeks ago dr samuel gaikwad and dr prema gaikwad returned from ias adventist institute international advanced studies so they are very special dr samuel gaikwad just before coming he was the acting vice president for academic affairs that's a very big responsibility and he has put in 47 years of work as a church administrator educator professor uh, and we are proud of him and uh, dr prema gaikwad sitting next to him thank you madam for joining um she put in 46 years of service she has been the head of the department of education young people somehow we do not know she has that magnet we attract them to 
to teach to to influence to to mentor them we we are really proud of you dr prema gaikwad and uh, next to dr prema is seated uh, dr solomon uh, who has been here who studied product of spicer college and he is working in bombay as the professor of an important college he comes from andhra rail sima but he is an ardent student of adventist education he has a unique experience ministering outside and he'll be able to add new dimensions to our topic today welcome dr solomon and then uh, the, perhaps one of the youngest we have in the team is honorable vice chancellor um uh, dr paul bagian the youngest uh, education institution perhaps we can say modified uh, northeast adventist university under metas uh, he has put in 18 years of service and he has done systematic theology from ias and uh, he is a very capable young uh, church leader in training the leaders and pastors in the education system i feel i am quite complete today in the team with such wonderful people and i will not take much time at least just to uh, give some facts before we go into the uh, topic that we have prepared this afternoon oh very deep 1896 7th adventist opened their first school in india in 14 bow bazar street in the bustling city of calcutta which is the british capital georgia a burris and martha may taylor two young american missionaries very young people administered the school where very soon where for girls the school is never open education system is never open but it in one year they could gather without any force voluntarily seeking admission 70 girls sitting in a crowded veranda in the bangalore they hired that is the beginning of adventist education on southern asia soil and how the lord blessed today today i am proud to say we have in southern asia we have 297 schools 117 elementary schools 174 secondary schools and six tertiary schools we have 10250 school teachers we have 2 lakhs 10140 students we have five colleges four nursing colleges and two universities god has blessed us in the great way 126 years of journey adventist education in southern asia division we should be proud of the way the lord has led us let me also say in few words simple words when adventist work started in india india was living in a rural setting and the missionary education was the most precious most attractive most uh, or one of the coveted thing because everyone want to send their children to adventist school so that they'll get english knowledge and also the lifestyle change into a more more basing on ethics character and development however today you see there is competition there is all kinds of uh, um, commercializing of education many other things you see the transformation we do not need to hide i just want to ask a very simple question to start with each of you if you can make a comment all of you have gone through adventist education do you feel that this has changed you or do you feel that it is like any other institution it i it did not make me any difference what do you feel in general in your personal life basing on your experience uh, because all of you are educators what do you think is there some uniqueness in adventist education personally first touch is how did it touch you or how did it transform you or do you think there is not much difference uh, dr samuel first oh uh, let me tell you my dear friends adventist education is the one that made me what i am amen <laughs> and i would like to say adventist education is the best education we can never look down upon adventist education we always want to say 
that it is the best why because it has unique characteristics that it offers to all students who join adventist education and therefore i think it is the best education that it can give and you know i have been to many institutions adventist institutions not only in southern asia division but around the world i have been to 43 different countries and i have been visited in most of those countries adventist institutions they offer the best education and there is a line of students who want to join the adventist education so i think it's the best that's a very strong affirmation from uh Pastor Dr. Samuel Gaikwad, I mean, having put in many years of service and also traveled worldwide connected with the education system, he affirms that this has been a unique blessing for him personally. How about Dr. Prema? What do you think? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. <laughs> Wilson, for this opportunity to respond. Um, well, Adventist education, how can I say um, enough about it? Character formation, when I think of the most important bit that we take to heaven is character. And Adventist education has helped me in my own character formation. And being an educator myself, I know that transformations have taken place in countless lives in classrooms, in Adventist institutions. And there's no doubt about that, that God is blessed Adventist education in a very special way. He has blessed other institutions, other denominations, other secular institutions, no doubt. But definitely it has a very, very special place in God's heart. In other words, Dr. Prema, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you are telling Adventist education is beyond the classroom education. It is emphasized on the character transformation. That's a very good point because uh, we believe in redemptive education and that's a focus and the purpose of our education. Thank you for that affirmation. How about Dr. Solomon? I think you went through at least the college life you have went through. Please. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the opportunity you gave me to share my thoughts to this uh, event. <clears throat> uh, I would like to say that um, uh, uh, Adventist education has really made a true change in my life. I mean, uh, what I mean to say is that, well, I did study outside my first 15 years of life, I mean, okay? And then I came over here to Spicer, and it is here my true education began, because uh, the Adventist education was something that was able to touch every aspect of my life, whether it is physical or mental or spiritual, social, in every way it was touching. And there were several unique things were here with Adventist education, you know, for example, the work education culture, you know, earn and learn scheme was, was initially introduced in India in Adventist institutions. Okay. So we were in that way pioneers in many good things in the educational institutions, which many international schools are introducing now. Okay. okay. We were much ahead of it. Even for example, this grading system, giving the grades and all that, you know, it's only, uh, you know, 2005 that UGC has introduced it, but we know that we have been having the grading system for decades together. So we were very much ahead of it. But at the same time, I want to caution that you know, now the other organizations and other institutions also are coming up, okay? And they are giving us a very tough competition. So we need to strengthen our education. We need to hold on to our principles and we need to uh, run our education situation in such a way that we will be able to cater to our children. Yeah. Here is a person, I still remember you working in library many hours. He is the man after books. <laughs> Many hours. So uh, his high school education was outside a non-education system. But then he affirms that when he came to college, there was total change and he was touched um, because it is a different kind of training, transformation of total personality. How about Dr. Bagyan? What You are, I think, son of a pastor or a church leader. Please, uh, what do you think? Um, you are uh, comfortable? You are satisfied with what church education uh, has given you? Uh, unlike uh, Dr. Solomon, uh, I may not be able to draw a contrast because I've never studied in non-Adventist institutions. So, uh, But here's what I want to say. I believe our education, if not for the Adventist church, 
education at home, in the church, in our Sabbath school, in the institution, and then wherever we went, you know, or be it in a residential hostel, in our, in our boarding school, all of this, I think the church is to be looked upon as an educational system, as, a, as an edu- I call it churchugation. <laughs> um, and I think that's what the church is really. When Jesus said, go and make disciples, teach them. And this was really the commission of the church to teach. And so I think we are in the right place. If not for Adventist church and the education that Adventist church imparts, I don't know where I'd be today. And like with uh, Dr. Gaikwad, I think I can easily resonate with what he says. It is what has made us who we are today. Thank you. Very good. How about uh, our youth director? What do you think? Uh, uh, did it make any change? Were you all through the Adventist education or you have some different... It uh, looks like you are also from Adventist background from the beginning. Can you make a comment? Uh, thank you, Pastor Wilson, for giving me this opportunity to talk about the Christian education. To be honest with you, that I never had uh, education outside. All throughout my life, I had my Christian education. But one thing that I would like to emphasize upon, that what I'm today is because of the Christian education and the church, as some of our panel members have spoken. Uh, especially, I come from a very humble family. And then uh, what uh, I am today is because of the church. The reason I said this is because the church provided me opportunity to work and study. Oh. And that changed my life. There were times that I felt that I should be out. But then it is the church who encouraged me and I'm self-made. And also, like, you know, the church provided me opportunity to work and earn my scholarship. And this is how I studied. And what I'm today is by the grace of God and because of our church and the school that I've gone through. Thank you. Very good. Brother Chen, what uh, comment do you make? Did it make any impact in your personal life? Yes, sir. Good afternoon to all the panel members. And thank you for this opportunity to speak. Uh, <clears throat> I have gone through both uh, education system, the outside, the government, and uh, the Adventist education system. At least for five years, I received the Adventist education and the rest of my education was uh, secular education outside in the college and university. Uh, I could not get the privilege to be here in the Spicer College due to some reason. At the time when I had finished my high school uh, in Rurki school, after that, I wanted to come to Spicer, but uh, somehow it did not work out. So I had to go out and study. But then the foundation was laid uh, in Rurki College. And though I come from, uh, from an Adventist background, even my grandfather, he worked in the mission. He was a pastor. So this is the third generation, Adventist generation. So, uh, the foundation was laid right there for five years and even though I went outside and studied, I yeah. did not leave those, uh, those yeah. values sure. which I had adopted in my early life. So, sure. whatever I am sure. today, had I gone to uh, sure. outside education and forgotten about the foundation, I don't think I would be sitting here this afternoon. So, the Spirit of God was leading me even though I was outside, but yet I could not, you know, just for the sake of study, I was there, but my heart and mind was in the education, in the Adventist education Amen. system. So, right after finishing my graduation, I immediately joined the Harvard School. Very good. As teacher. And from then on, there is no... The Lord has been using you. Yes, sir. We praise God for your leadership. Thank Let you. us go to different uh, look at this topic. Uh, how can we attract um, young people? I'm trying to be realistic, uh, dear brothers here. 1940, the division president at, this ta- at that time, Neil C. Wilson told, 
success of our work in southern asia division is very closely bound up with the success of the our education institutions that means training the young people for the church and the work for the work but today someone was whispering uh, adventist education we may be wasting our resources because now the world has picked up it has become more commercial do the adventist yes. church still has a role do you think we are uh, we are going in the right direction when we entered 126 years ago there was no education for children the education was primarily for the elite especially the brahmans now the check, education is check. open to all so the world has check. opened many institutions check, check, check. so check. my question at this moment is do you still today i mean uh, prophetically speaking towards the end of the world now according to the bible you still think that we need to proclaim this redemptive education what is your thought uh, should we put in our resources train our people uh, i'm speaking in a in a holistic way i'm speaking about special schools we have blind school deaf school we have university education we have elementary chet schools and uh, we have boarding schools later on we will divide into parts but in general still in southern asia we are basically hindu and muslim built okay do you still think in the modern times we have to still work on adventist education because someone was telling government is doing so much independently there is competition how about our children should they go out what do you think still do we have a role to play in terms of education i'm sorry okay uh maybe first brother bakian what do you think um i i truly believe that there, there is a important role we need to play but i i sense a problem here the problem is we need to check always be relevant relevant um when the missionaries came yes that was a time to education was a way to penetrate through the darkness of heathenism in india Uh, it was a wonderful way to do that but now times have changed so much our mission has uh, diversified in a big way we are literally living in a literal uh, in a virtual world yeah. and so i i believe we need to venture out beyond education i would think so naturally for reaching a world that is so a uh, glue to the screen we need to come up with a strategy uh, our schools may need to revamp their curriculum so that we can have educated professionals who can look at how to build a virtual system and so i think there's a lot of room that we can look at how we can improve the education system but our schools are still relevant i believe very okay. strongly very good very good he is not mincing his words he is direct and said still we need education system uh, i i personally i agree with you that because um, um, church is like having a two wheels of the bullock cart while the ministry is going on all these institutions education health and welfare work must also go on if not uh, we will be going around and not progressing further how about dr prema how, what do you think well talking about marketing um there are two important product uh, entities for marketing uh, that's product and process okay now the one who's selling if you're not convinced about the product you're selling uh, i don't think people will be convinced so all of us who are engaged in this work of education we should have a conviction that we have a product to give to others and that product is god ordained okay a character building um work all right um plan of salvation through every aspect of uh, the curriculum hidden curriculum the uh, the way people treat each other in the campus outside the campus all this can affect the students and this product has to be um something that everyone is committed to and it can be then seen and the process is another one we should have various um innovative ways to channel our our product education definitely you are hinting that. at some advertising yes, more talking advertisements 
word of mouth uh, and then online ways and students engaging in a holistic way of um, sharing okay. God's message. It's not only in the classroom, but outside. Word of mouth. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just quickly thinking of what happened uh, in a traditional way when my father, a young <laughs> professional working in a non Adventist school, he got a voice of prophecy track. Um. And, you know, God had blessed that track. Okay. And he, he was convinced that Adventism is the way to go. He was not an Adventist. Okay. okay that was a traditional way. Even today it can work if that process is blessed by God. On the other hand, in the Philippines, we have meeting points where Adventist young people meet in restaurants. And you know that's a very innovative way of mm. meeting WhatsApp groups there and they find the time to meet and they discuss many things. And then our Adventist youth will tell something about, you know, uh, God's ways and Many are touched you, by that. That's an innovative way, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. You really touch the core of the topic. Thank you, Dr. Prem. I really appreciate it. I mean, it's not the principal's job uh, only to bring the students in enrollment, but it is every person, you are benefited by this education. You, are, you have tasted its goodness. Therefore, in some way or the other, maybe through technology, media or communication or word of mouth, some way or the other to explain to someone that I am blessed by this, kindly bring your... I was traveling recently from Hyderabad to Pune here and opposite him was sitting a Muslim lady and she was telling, this boy, my son, um, he is studying in Gautam Institute. They are not teaching anything. I did not ask, I never told who I am and all. She said, this boy, next June, I'm planning to put him in seventh day school. What? I'm seventh day Adventist. So why do you want to do what? Different? I heard they teach Bible and Quran tells us, go learn from the people of the book Bible. And they teach morals and they encourage the children in, in a, in a non-secular way. And we are very happy, comfortable to that. What she told exactly that lady was... Because there is something unique Adventist education is offering. Okay. Yes. How about Dr. Samuel? Well, uh, I agree with all that is said here. Thank you for the opportunity. We are providing Adventist education, but not only as a, uh, you know, the traditional way that we are have been doing. The What is needed in the world now is to think ahead. We have been providing education the same way year after year and year after year. But are we providing the product that is needed in the world today for the workforce, for our young people to find jobs? What are we providing them? You know, some is everybody is not endowed with uh, finance or endowed with the kind of opportunity to go ahead and complete very high education. And, uh, you know, also... Just by getting a degree doesn't mean that you'll get a job. Degrees are now uh, like a degree meals. Everybody is getting degrees. But what can a person do with his or her hand? Are we providing avenues for vocational training? Okay. We are not doing that. Vocational training is something needed. And you know, it's short term vocational training. There are institutions which are providing vocation. And we should also start something like that, I think. You are talking hinting at skill-based yes. um, uh, training that uh, young people can easily get into some kind of job and stand on themselves. Because after my education, I had to wait almost uh, four or five months. Some pastor retired and in his place, they kept me, employed me because um, there is no vacancy. There is no budget. I mean, we are not running the education system to employ within the church. But we want young people to come and taste of goodness, put their foundation properly so that and when they, whatever um, education they want to achieve, they we are willing to give. But our goal is to give them proper perspective of their life. How, what do you think about the topic, the, 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 the perspective of uh, Adventist education? It's unique. Yes, please. Okay, now I will begin with a Greek philosopher. Aristotle once said, educating the mind without educating the heart is not education at all. Oh, 
Okay. And we find that Seventh-day Adventist is concentrating on that. And if you read in the book of education, page 13, it says, a true education is the harmonious development of physical, the mental, the spiritual. It is there. And it is true that we provide. One of the essential things that we need to think about, that is the uh, qualified teachers and dedicated teachers. That's what is required. If we have the uh, qualified teachers and dedicated teachers, that is, and then so definitely it is better, in fact, the best education that Seventh-day Adventists can provide. Very good. Uh, one key point that I heard from you is the attraction of the child into our school system is the teacher should be willing to be really inspire the young person. Uh, I remember um, after finishing the 12th uh, plus 2 and all, I was to take in, go take the subject theology program and all. Uh, and I never liked history, but I took religious history because uh, Dr. Uh, Elia Willis, um, archaeology man and history man, he's so hardworking, very well organized systematic in correcting the paper, encouraging, calling. And I was really touched by his leadership and I felt this is a good teacher and I want to take, though I personally do not like that topic, but uh, I took that subject and today I learned much from him. Some teachers really attract and hundreds of uh, students who have gone through this, they talk about both of them. So it is not only um, getting a degree, but the inspiration that we impart to each student that come into our premises. Do you agree for that? Yes, that sir. has important role to play. Brother Chand, what else you have to add in this? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, when students are uh, coming to an institution to seek admission, you know, they have so many questions in their minds. Which course to take, what to take, what not to take. There are so many uh, questions in their minds. So if an institution can, um, you know, handle or um, give information uh, to the students which are actually student focused information okay then uh, you know uh, students will understand better and it, they will be in a better position to to take admission in the school so an institution must provide the student focused information uh, either on their website or blogs or whatever it may be but it should be student focused information so that students will not be confused. They will be clear as to what they have to do because when they come to study, they, they don't just uh, look at the course that they are going to take, but the, what are the opportunities after that? Okay. What they are going to, whether they will get an employment or not. If they take a certain course, where is it going to lead them? So that is very important. So uh, an institution must uh, provide the student-focused information. So that is very important. That is one aspect I'm talking about. I think you touched one important note there. Um, when a, a, a high school graduate come in and want to take up the higher, high, high, I mean, uh, higher education, as he lands up into the college, I think one or two days he must be able to talk to a few mentors who will be able to guide them. What is your interest? What is your talent? Um, 10 years from now, 5 years from what do you want to look at? Uh, I noticed um, in my career when I was going as a pastor, promoting and all, some people, young people come and say, sir, I did uh, uh, engineering, I did some technology, I, I did some computer, but no job, sir. So before getting into the job, uh, that kind of studies, you must know you have opportunities or not. Um, you are on demand or not. For example, today's crazy is many girls go to nursing uh, education. Correct? Nursing education. And uh, it is true and upon, upon completion, they are in a hurry even to complete, uh, you know, in a good uh, hospital gain experience and even grow abroad. Um, we don't mean everything that we are too commercialized, but we want also mission oriented. We want young people to join the into Adventist education to build their future and also to support the church. Um, we are discussing, dear panel members, I think we have a few hundreds on the on the YouTube and the WhatsApp groups they are watching. Uh, young people, um, Adventist education is still needed. It's much valued 
and uh, church is focused on transforming young people we have the gift of redemptive to education let us move further on what we can do can we identify some unique differences um, compared to outside school to our uh, adventist education what do the young person see different from uh, outside uh, education um, maybe i don't think they'll have uh, celebrations like drinking and dancing when they have some kind of programs and all we have all things in discipline but apart from that academically uh, or uh, weekends whatever what do you think is the so unique um, um, factors that can uh, that uh, the distinctive adventist philosophy of education what unique characters that we can offer to our young people to join into our adventist system uh, whoever is want to make a comment in this area what are some unique uh, uh characters what are talents uh, maybe i'll make one uh, yes. input here you see there are a lot of students who have gone through the adventist education system and now they are serving many of them in government departments many are uh, in the ministries many in, in big positions they, they are occupying so sometimes we bump into them those people and uh, when we start a conversation uh, they will say that yes we have gone to a certain school or certain college adventist education you see so alumni they are talking so one point that i want to stress over here is engaging the alumni in the admission process okay <laughs> engage the alumni in the admission process when the students are coming for admission there should be the alumni who will be sitting there and guiding them and they may be uh you know if time permits they can tell their success stories how they went through the adventist education and where they are so success stories are also very important and they play a very vital role in uh, the life of the students okay because they will be inspired uh, by looking at them by looking at the alumni they will be inspired so very good yes yeah, so that that, that is also very important and Uh, so far we have not been doing this uh, in our schools in our colleges but if we do that i think it will make a difference okay yes uh, definitely very very nice the, i mean uh, when we join spicer college i think first year there is one hour of orientation uh, how to select your subject and all that but what brother chand is uh, hinting at is how you can get the maximum benefit of uh, the the uh, education system here what are the facilities available uh, all that that's a very good point thank you uh, uh, what are some of the uh, factors uh, unique uh, factors of adventist yeah, education yeah, doc, uh, the uniqueness of adventist education is this you know whenever we study a, in any of the other institutions you will find that they are sometimes they are curriculum oriented curriculum yes. centered books yes and all that grades yeah grades and sometimes some of institutions are oriented towards teacher centered whatever teacher says is right and so everybody just listens to teacher not going beyond that sometimes it is a student centered now that is very important student centered education we teach uh, so that the students will learn okay but adventist education not only encompasses all these things but has something called christ centered education very good where it is integration of faith and learning into mm. the educational system so that the foundation of the person is such that they are not only preparing for this world but for the world to come and that is where the difference comes and so to make that happen we need to be like christ christ centered education is like christ not only reaching out to people and giving them the scriptural knowledge or uh, helping them understand the word of god but how we should live our lifestyle should depict as to what kind of people we are and that is um, when people look at us they should say i would like to be like them uh huh let me let me send my children to that particular school because those people are so helpful those people why do they do the way they the things they do and so that should be our motive and that will attract many people to send their children to our i place. totally agree with dr samuel gaikwad in this aspect uh personally i was a village boy grew up in the play school but the real college education transformation took place i was very shy and 
would not like to meet people but the weekend services that the and the morning devotions and the hostel life gave us a courage and new dimensions and as a result being a self supporting student i could go out and canvas and learn so faith and learning integration and also doing yourself i mean you are trying not to depend on someone you are trying to do by yourself that is a real quality development and that's a part of education and i'm really have dr prema you are about. yes i just want to add along with that uh, uh, other than integration of faith and learning uh, as a continuation um, there is something called the hidden curriculum hidden curriculum is something that is engulfing the entire life of the person all right and it happens through uh, relationships okay out inside the class outside the class on a 24/7 basis all right and i think teachers are in touch with students even after classes are over okay so and how they are dealing with them how much they care it impacts and uh, what my husband just said about the impact of adventist education i just have experiences from my own family uh two sons studied here at um spicer in the high school up to high school then they went for medical studies and it was non adventist <laughs> and we were always worried uh, how are they doing okay but when they became surgeons my son older son tells often patients ask him are you a christian <laughs> he works in institutions uh, hospitals where most of them are not christians okay but they just want to ask him are you a christian and he wonders why are you asking because his name bine doesn't sound christian as such you know you are very kind you are patient uh, we have we just feel you're different and we praise god when we hear such testimonies and you know we don't regret that you know they went to medical school and not adventist medical school we don't have uh, but the foundation that they received earlier on definitely has an impact on these things that's a very strong testimony uh, the young people who are watching online uh, please share the word uh, adventist church has a unique education system in not only academic excellence but it transforms your life if you are thinking of um, uh, recommending your uncle's children your uh, some someone children we need um that um your uh, young generation must be recommended to adventist education it has some unique characters to uh, to offer something different uh, you enter into any adventist education it is a totally a new atmosphere because the campus is offered with prayer and that is serving the purpose of the mission of the church and it is offering redemptive education thank you dr frema for able to open your personal testimony How, what has changed your son and people coming to him and said are you a christian that that is not because of the word of mouth but because of our service to them and that is the uniqueness and the beauty of christian education dr solomon i think yeah just a small statement that i just want to add over here uh, as what we are talking about it uh, i would say in summary that Uh, adventist education make a person essentially service oriented and this is something that is actually missing very badly in the society today service minded people who yeah i mean a lot of people who are who are who are spending a lot of money and educating themselves you know they are ending up becoming very selfish yes whatever the sir i mean they don't think about you know what the talents that they have gained to be used for the betterment of the people I mean, they think about how to make more money about that. Uh huh. And and there's a deep contrast. We, uh, <laughs> Dr. Prem, I yes, think Dr. Dr. Solomon that. is referring to going the extra mile, yeah. maybe extra two miles or three miles, and this is what uh, real service is all about. Yes. And each one of us, uh, staff, faculty, students, everyone, we have an opportunity for that, and yes. it, and it shows. Correct. Okay. Mm. I really agree. Thank you for that. I mean. going through our system people will be always willing to look at the others need rather than look at himself and for himself that is a very important point looks like we are now already 45 minutes spent uh, we want to move forward unless you have something unique to say um next 10 minutes or 12 minutes before we conclude um 
how can we um, improve our system to attract more young people i'm talking about the day schools we have um uh, children come to our campuses and go more come in the morning leave in the evening but i'm so really interested in the boarding schools also because boarding schools give us the future workers i believe you 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 think that I very much agree with that yes and church is investing at least some money in that and um, we have some special schools like blind school deaf school that is fully sponsored and all that today's education system we are struggling because government and commercialized we are not able to attract many children and also we are not able to upkeep the beauty of the campus like other great institutions who are investing a lot of money those are one or two difficulties and enrollment is low and our not able to pay the salaries we are having some challenges especially during the covid our institutions have really affected can you imagine two years no income and still we have to pay so these are some challenges we are facing what remedial what correctional thoughts do you have to improve so that we can attract more young people into our church uh, into our school systems any suggestions so that the education directors who are listening young people who are listening or teachers who may be listening may pass on to our education people and uh, they will be able to take at least few measures to improve uh, these uh, uh, wonderful people came with a lot of experience and uh, you have been working outside and you know uh, what good things uh, some of our schools like metas before they could complete their degree course people are at the door from different companies to hire them that extreme quality is displayed there but some schools like in villages some towns we are not really cope up to that standard what suggestions what um, what thoughts that are to improve to attract our our goal is to witness to the society in which the, uh, the 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 institution is located our goal is to tell that we are still working we may be 126 years old but we have important role to play in the modern society to the younger generation today please make a comment feel free for me i personally don't believe in this one that uh, we cannot do this one like uh, if we maintain the quality of okay. education i don't see any reason why there should be drop out otherwise our schools should not be doing that good number one number two we should have as i mentioned earlier that we have we should have qua uh, qualified and dedicated teachers if they go extra miles as madam prema was speaking about if a teacher goes extra miles and if we maintain the quality i don't see any reason and of course we need to like um, introduce jesus to them you know like in james 117 which says every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from father and further it says and that grace and truth comes through jesus christ we need to depend on god see rather depending on ourselves rather putting our efforts let's first trust in the lord and then do and maintain god expects each one of us to do our best okay that is what i believe in and as in ecclesiastes 9 10 says whatsoever thy hand findeth to do do it with all your might and i don't see any reason why our school should not be doing good you have a big faith that's very good and you he brought out a good points that teachers should be extremely dedicated and able to attract through their inspiration to the service and maintain the quality automatically our enrollment will increase brother chen yes sir i would definitely go with the pastor binoy what he said about quality of education it's the quality of education that makes an institution stand apart if you maintain the quality students will come no matter what happens they will come but then there are other factors also every school has a culture every school has a character every school has a history so we can say every school is unique so what makes your institution unique that we have to find out and one of the ways of finding out is you have to talk to your staff find out what they think about the school what they think about the institution what image 
they are projecting to the outsiders okay local society yes mm -hmm. it counts a lot sometimes we neglect this so we have to see what image they are projecting to the outsiders we have to talk to the parents also what they think about the school or the, the institution and their comments may be you know uh, may be posted on the on the social media because now it is the age of social media and a lot of people they they uh, they are on the social media so when they read the comments you know the word will spread and when there are good comments about the institution you know students will come many will come many parents will come so we have to do some inside uh, you know uh, work also sometimes we neglect the staff the the ancillary staff uh, maybe sometimes teachers also so their input is also very very important yes correct A any other comment what do you think what improvement or suggestion uh, to make change within our management or education system to attract more young people enrollment into our system please usually when we talk about this i can just tell you the experience of what's happening at uh, northeast adventist university when we talk this one usually we get the idea that our students are our best advertisements okay um our students become the ambassadors uh, we don't need to do anything extra give the best to our students so how can we actually we talked about improving the quality how can we improve the quality of our educational system i think this will depend largely on what we just mentioned getting qualified people then apart from that christ centered education is one unique aspect and i would think also um relevant updated curriculum very important and the pedagogy what kind of pedagogy are we using are we using old style pedagogy uh the learning uh teaching experience is so very crucial so that is very important a robust uh assessment system very very important do we have an assessment system that kills student or is it a student friendly assessment system now if you look at the nep the national education policy they recommend for a student friendly approach so what we did at neu is we did away with mid semester examinations we wanted to do a continuous formative assessment of our students so we did away with mid semesters no more mid semester instead we have term papers assignments reading reports and then we spread the mid semester into three tests over the semester and so you can actually make a better assessment of our students progression all throughout that semester uh, another thing that we need to also keep in mind is a student support system the mentorship uh, i think we mentioned that the student support system while at school is very very important uh, the mentoring of uh, our students so i think all of this placement mentoring uh, professional counseling with our students will be very very crucial so i think if we are talking about this this will really help us in creating a better system for our schools okay very good uh, you explain what you plan to do there at the northeast and some we some, are already doing that actually, yes, yes that's good um, yesterday i was talking to in this preparation we were discussing dr samuel gaiko told it is important that we uh, go with the new national education policy their focus is on skill based education we do not have even one um, uh, skill based education institution in the whole of southern asia uh, how to do some electrical thing carpentry thing tailoring thing so that those young people who are satisfied with simple they can have some skills and they can go as walden dis walden sees missionaries and support the church this is what we want up to 10th or 12th standard they may study but if they think this is what they want learn some skill and get settled and then witness somewhere that is the greatest way uh, skill based thing is something very very important and it is time that we attract many young people into our education system basing our boarding schools must be strengthened uh, mission workers must be uh, coming with committed commitment only those mission workers who can contribute well is through the boarding school workers there are some people who commented when i asked them sponsorship programs are a blessing but these days some young people are becoming too lazy 
so we should uh, see that those child who, uh, children who are getting the sponsorship must also learn the value of sponsorship and willing to contribute for the church in, instead of uh, getting the degree and flying off to some other country so we want more young people to join church is willing to can you imagine almost to 2 to 300 people uh, every year we are putting 80% of scholarship for nursing for theology programs for education programs church is spending enough money only that those young people when we spend for the child he should return for the church in in terms of service any other comment before we conclude because we already got the signal dr prema uh, yeah i think um, combining all the ideas that are shared by these gentlemen uh, teacher training program should be improved higher education institutions should provide strong teacher training program amen yes yes and uh, every adventist higher education uh, institution should have teacher training programs we need countless number of teachers and where are they coming from that's right they should come from adventist higher education institutions and uh, one more thing i think church should promote schools i think church is completely often forgetting there is something called school <laughs> do we have uh, education promotional sermons uh, you know are there lay people aware of the existence of our schools and the needs of the schools mm -hmm. there are very rich lay people who can um, mobilize their money for the service of the school but they are not even aware of what our schools are about that's right we need to promote pastors should collaborate with school entities and promote education correct before i give the concluding thought anything uh, any okay i really want to appreciate uh, these wonderful panel members um they have a rich experience as you could see them they have the real burden i like the last thought you presented sometimes we are not showing real importance priority to schools and uh, educating the teachers in a proper way so that they in turn will go and inspire the young children uh, we want all the young people to come and taste the goodness of the lord through the education system and every education center must be a dedicated thing it is a missionary thing general conference said in the education department i was reading in that book uh, uh, the magazine that this is the longest evangelistic period when a child comes in at first standard and leaves at 12th standard uh, he is staying almost 10 years with us and therefore um, if he is not touched by the by the message that we have something is wrong with our system and if he <laughs> it's very interesting um, those the moment he steps in he is a potential child for eternity so we want to see that every child Um, people are watching out there if you are looking for salvation of your children transformation of character something to make out of not only academics but overall personality development come to education system our schools are open and our teachers are ready to serve you god bless you as you set this word all around and promote adventist education i want to thank you all for your kindness we will stand for prayer loving god we thank you for the church we not only have the gospel message we have the redemptive education o oh lord we thank you for 297 schools colleges and universities we want to strengthen our education work in bhutan nepal and maldives o oh lord of heaven we thank you that you have given us such a great challenge such a noble work bless every institution we plead with you there may be some financial challenges low enrollment it's because we must have failed in the work that is placed before us let every church administrator every teacher be dedicated completely for its complete work of redemptive education o oh lord we thank you for these panel members bless them o oh lord may this message continue to shine and share so the thousands will be saved when the lord shall come in jesus precious name we pray thank you all blessings to you appreciate
everybody, I would like to thank the, the chairman, Dr. M. Wilson, and the members who have taken part in the symposium. I'm sure that each and every one of us have been blessed. At this time, at this time, we'll have the seminars. Seminar one will be conducted here. Seminars two, three, four, and five will be online. Seminar one, the topic is reflecting Adventism in a secular environment in the light of multicultural societal views. It will be taken up by Dr. Sven, Director of Ministry and Strategy of the South Pacific Division. And the moderator will be uh, Mrs. Sharon Rocha. Seminar 2, the topic is Principles and How to Start Campus Ministry. The, this seminar will be taken up by Dr. Jiwan Moon. He is the former GC PCM Director and the moderator for this seminar will be Pastor Ajit Kumar, who is the PCM Director of the Southwest India Union. Seminar 3, the topic is Mission Opportunities in Secular Campuses. This will be taken up by Dr. Paco and um, the moderator will be uh, Mr. Sunil Ayang. Ayanki, he is the Vice President of the Metas College in Ranchi. Seminar 4, the topic is Growing Deeper in Christ in a Non-Adventist Atmosphere. This will be taken up by Mr. Hudson. He is the GC Associate Education Director. And the moderator will be Mr. Naveen Isaiah. He is the PCM Coordinator for the Lowry Adventist College. And seminar five, the topic is career, God's perspective versus marketplace perspective. And this will be taken up by Dr. Samuel Gaikwad and the moderator will be Mr. Anil uh, Kandane. We hope that each and every one of you will be blessed. Check. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's nice to have you all here with us. This afternoon we have uh, Dr. Sven Ostring who is joining us through Zoom. We're so glad you could be here with us. Uh, I'm here to introduce him and the topic that he would be presenting to us this uh, afternoon. Dr. Sven Ostring is the Director for Ministry and Strategy at the South Pacific Division. He completed his PhD in uh, Computer Networking at the University of Canterbury, New Zealand and he was a research fellow at the computer laboratory in the Cambridge University before responding to a clear personal call to ministry. While studying theology at Avondale, he was serving as the president of the Australian Adventist Students Association from 2004 to 2008. During his initial ministry appointment, he served as the university chaplain for the Western Australian Conference. He was also the multi-faith officer at Curtin University from 2008 to 2013. He planted a church called Axe University Church at the Curtin University. Dr. Ostring is currently serving, uh, he's currently serving as a visiting Seventh-day Adventist chaplain at the University of Sydney. He is also the Pacific, South Pacific Division Chaplaincy Liaison for the General Conference and the South Pacific Division representative on the Global Geoscience Research Institute Committee. He is completing his MA in uh, Pastoral Leadership through Avondale University and Dr. Ostring had uh, kindly accepted a last minute call to replace Dr. Gilbert Kangi, who at the moment is not keeping too well to join us to present his paper. So we're so glad that uh, Dr. Ostring is uh, willing to join us and present a paper this afternoon. We thank you so much, Dr. Ostring, for the last minute uh, challenge and uh, accepting it to be amongst us. Uh, Dr. Ostring will be presenting to us uh, a paper on the topic, Reflecting Adventism in a Secular Environment in the Light of Multicultural Societal Views. May we all be blessed as we listen to him. Uh, here uh, this afternoon, and I hope all you can all hear me. 
uh, as I, I present this afternoon. It's um, it's really good to be able to join you in India via Zoom, even though I am actually in uh, Newcastle, uh, in Australia at, at the moment. And that's just two hours north of, of Sydney. And uh, we, we really enjoy our uh, family life here. Let me just share my screen with you. And I want to share with you a little bit more about my story and uh, so that you can get to, to know uh, me as a person uh, before I head into the, the topic uh, for today, which is, uh, let me just get my screen organized here. Uh, so that you can see it and um, yeah so I I actually grew up in a place that you probably wouldn't expect uh, with my name as um, Sven Erstring uh, I grew up in the the very uh, global city of Hong Kong uh, and that's of course on on the south um, east coast of of China uh, and one of the things I did there is I went to a Chinese school and I was able to uh, to make a lot of friends, particularly amongst the Chinese students. But I had one of my best friends in Hong Kong was actually a Indian uh, young man. His name was Ahmed Saifullah. And I'm sure you can tell by the by the name that he was a Muslim uh, young man from a Muslim family, uh, but we're still good friends even to to this day. But I really enjoyed my my time in Hong Kong. After um, one minute, let me just sorry about that. Um, let me just get my video going, uh, and I'll just share again. My apologies. Uh, after that, my family and I went back to New Zealand because. Uh, we wanted to to go to university, and my mother was from New Zealand, and and we returned to Christchurch where my my grandparents were. Uh, Christchurch is known as the Garden City, and, and it truly is very very amazing, uh, really beautiful. These are the botanical gardens right there in Christchurch. In Christchurch, I went to the University of Canterbury, um, studied electrical engineering, and then my, did my PhD in computer networking. Uh, having finished that. I went to the, the beautiful uh, town um, of Cambridge in England. I uh, got a research uh, fellowship position uh, in the computer laboratory and had um, two and a half amazing years learning how to punt on the River Cam, uh, which you can see right in front of you, and also listening to uh, in the in the college gardens each summer. Things like um, uh, Winter Tale and and other other plays like that. It was a beautiful experience, but it was very fascinating. When I went to England, I think that you will lose your faith when you go to England. Um, it's a very secular country. From the, uh, the title of my, my talk this afternoon. But it's interesting because when I got to England, it was certainly a secular country, but I, I moved into this uh, shared accommodation with the atheist and evolutionist. And one of my friends, uh, Valerie, asked me uh, the question that changed my life, changed the direction of my life. And because of that, I, I came back to Australia to study theology and uh, have been working in ministry for, uh, this is my 17th year uh, now. And currently I'm in the beautiful city of uh, Newcastle, which you can see on the screen uh, with my, my family, my wife, Marilyn, and my two kids, Samuela and Nathaniel as well. But diving into the topic for uh, for this afternoon, reflecting Adventism in a secular, multicultural community. Uh, I just simplified the, uh, shortened, I should say, the title there, there a little bit. But I want to focus on that word secular, uh, because many of the other words you will all recognize and you'll understand. But the word secular is, is a little bit more... Uh, needs some explanation, needs needs to be unpacked. And so I just want to, to go through history to find out what that means. We'll go back all the way to, to France and the French Revolution. 
uh, the the people of France were revolting, and and why were they? Uh, do, why did they launch this revolution? It was because they had been oppressed by the the church at that time, the medieval church of rome had oppressed them for for centuries uh they they had fleeced them of their money to to make the the cathedrals to build the cathedrals they they had um they had abused the people uh they had lauded it over uh the the peasants and the farmers and because of this that they wanted to overthrow the power of the church and what do they do uh, they they needed to put something in its place, and that was the goddess of reason. That they, they they wanted to worship reason, human reason, um, in place of the church and God. They wanted to throw off the shackles of religion. Now, of course, the the it makes a lot of sense, and and from this uh, flows a lot of the scientific thought of which we have benefited greatly. But the question you need to ask yourself is this. Okay, so they didn't trust the church, the Church of Rome, um, and they wanted to put their trust, even their worship, in something else. But the, the question that we need to ask ourselves is this. Why would you trust human reason? It's a very interesting question. If you go to uh, the... Uh, the the person of Charles Darwin, uh, who who developed the Darwinian theory of evolution, he wrote a letter to his friend William uh, Graham, who pointed out some of the intelligent design aspects that is found in nature, and he said, "Thank you very much for sharing those with me." But in this letter, dated third of July, eighteen eighty one, Charles Darwin confessed. A, a, a very significant uh, thought that always came to his mind. He said this, but then with, within me, the horrid doubt always rises whether the convictions of man's mind, human reason, which is developed from the human mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Why would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind. And so what he's saying is this, we wouldn't trust the thoughts of a monkey or a, a baboon or, or a um, an ox. Um, but if we evolved from those creatures, why would we trust human reason? It's a very, very important question. Then uh, the other thing, of course, is uh, um, secularism has a deep commitment or the, the type that grew developed from France um, has a deep commitment to moral values. The abuse of the church was wrong. It, we needed to move towards a just society. But the question once again is this, where did the moral values that secularism that France developed um, and elsewhere as well, where did they come from? Within Christianity, those moral values are grounded in the nature of God himself. But what about in secularism? Where did they come from? But of course, some of these things are just kind of swept aside in secularism. And what we find around the world is that societies are changing. For example, in the Washington Post, the, the, um, uh, a, a news, uh, newspaper or article on religion um, was titled this way, American secularism is growing and growing more complicated. Its impact on politics and self-identity looms large, experts say. So you can read the, uh, the news articles and the research reports. Uh, secularism is alleged to be growing in the United States. And of course, that's true uh, for Australia as well. Uh, from the University of Melbourne, there is this report titled Losing Our Religion. Australians are rapidly dropping their religious affiliation. Even among those who are religious, the importance of their faith is relatively low, the Hilda survey finds. Uh, and you can read that report on online. However, I want to dive into the, the question of whether the secularism of France 
America and Australia is actually the same secularism which is being referred to in the Indian um, and the um, SUD context. Uh, so so I, I did my background research and I found on the, the Hindu um, uh, newspaper, understanding secularism in the Indian context, it is slightly different. And it's important to be aware of that as, as well. Uh, the, the Indian Express says, um, reports a dirge for secularism, secularism in India, um, stating that along with the resurgence of religiosity has come the othering of Muslims and to a lesser extent Christians who now live in a social milieu bristling with distrust and hate. And the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace actually wrote about the fate of secularism in India. Uh, in the, the um, Journal of Secularism and Non-Religion, uh, there's a research article unraveling the Indian conception of secularism tremors of the pandemic and beyond. So, so there's something happening, not only in, in France, in, in America and uh, in Australia, but in India itself, in your division uh, too. And I just wanted to dive, what, what is it? What, what is the Indian conception of religion? Jahawal uh, Harwal uh, Nehru, uh, the, the first prime minister of India, uh, expressed it very well, very concisely. He wrote, we talk about a secular state in India. It is perhaps not very easy even to find a good word in Hindi for secular some people think it means something opposed to religion that is obviously not correct. What it means is that it is a state which honors all faiths equally and gives them equal opportunities. So this is the, the, the constitutional foundation that Nehru actually was, was working towards uh, together with the other uh, people, politicians in India. Savar Pali uh, Radha, Radha Krishnan, uh, the first president of India uh, made uh, similar comments when he said, when India is said to be a secular state, it does not mean that we reject the reality of an unseen spirit or the relevance of religion or, of life or that we exalt irreligion. It does not mean that secularism itself becomes a positive religion or that the state assumes divine prerogatives. Though faith in the supreme is the basic principles of the Indian traditions, the Indian state shall not identify itself with or be controlled by any particular religion. Uh, and he goes on to say, we hold that no one religion should be given preferential status or unique distinction, that no one religion should be accorded special privileges in national life or international relations. For that would be a violation for the basic principles of democracy and contrary to be the best interest of religion and government. This view of religious impartiality or comprehension and forbearance has a prophetic role to play within the national and international life. And I recognize obviously participants will be joining us from Sri Lanka and Nepal and, and um, uh, other places in, um, in the division, but this gives us a, a ground to work from. So, uh, to kind of summarize, India has developed its own unique recipe for secularism. And I know that this is a very um, unfair to give you a picture of a tally on the screen uh, this afternoon, just before dinner, when you're when you're all hungry. Uh, but but it's a it's a good analogy. There's a unique recipe for secularism in India. And of course, what it's referring to is it's the approach that its secular state takes towards all the religions in India. However, and this is from the reports I've read from the research that I've done, uh, and I'm sure that you would be aware of it, Indian secularism is being challenged by Hindu majoritarianism, um, Hindu forces, and the Bharat, um, sorry, Bharat Janata Party, BJP as well. So something's happening in this world. There, there's something kind of boiling underneath um, what we see. And, and we see this in, in Europe. We see this in, in North America. We see this in Australia. We see it in the Pacific. Something is happening. But we need to understand 
how we can move forward, how we can reflect Adventism in this kind of secular environment. So I guess the question you might be asking this afternoon is this, what are we talking about? Are we talking about the French or Indian secularism uh, this afternoon? Well, I want to say uh, that we're talking about both. Um, I'm going to dodge the dodge the question. Students, lecturers, is that while these big political and ideological things may may be occurring in our society, what we're really talking about is individual people who we will walk across campus with, who we'll go to lectures with, and we'll spend time doing laboratory um, exercises with and, and doing work placements with as well. But what is secularism? Secularism is something that we have to keep religion private. That, that there's so many different religious faiths and worldviews and ideologies out there that, that, that we need to keep it private in a way and that we, we shouldn't privilege any particular world view. We need to remember that, that the friends and classmates, the staff members and colleagues, um, our professors have a, may have a different worldview and we should respect it. We should we should simply acknowledge this and we shouldn't, as they might say, rock the boat in terms of our faith. However, this is the challenge that we face because the Seventh-day Adventist church believes in truth, present truth. We believe that we are teaching the truth. And the fact is this, friends, brothers and sisters, Truth holds a privileged position, even though Nehru and um, and uh, the other politicians who created the Indian Constitution may have said, "We will not privilege, we will not uh, give preference to any particular religious worldview." Our position is that we hold the truth, and the fact is that truth holds a privileged position. Why is that? It's because truth corresponds with reality. You can have a, a, a hundred, a thousand, a million false ideas. There can be only one truth which corresponds with reality. And because of that, we are committed to something which actually stands in some ways in contradiction, contrary to secularism. We believe in truth. And it goes back to that famous question, which Pilate, the, the Roman governor, asked Jesus, what is truth? What is truth? And, of course, he didn't stop to really hear the answer to his question, what is truth? But the incredible reality is this, um, students and, and professors and lecturers, is that truth was actually the person standing in front of Pilate. That, that person with a crown of thorns on his head, with, with whip marks and blood running down his back, this person was truth itself. Jesus himself said um, the, on the, um, the night before, or, or, or earlier that night, I should say, he told his disciples in the upper room, I am the way and the truth and the life. I am truth. I am truth. I stand um, in, in contrast, in, in, in contradiction to secularism itself. I am the truth is what Jesus um, said. And what does he mean by this? What he means is this, as creator, Jesus is the unifying and integrative foundation for reality, of reality. He holds all of reality together. As sustainer, Jesus upholds reality. And finally, as redeemer and judge, Jesus is the restorer of future reality as well. This is a beautiful thing that the, the truth that we hold to is actually found in a person. And that person 
is Jesus himself. But you might be saying to, to me this afternoon, wow, that, that sounds very philosophical. It's, it's very, you know, almost metaphysical, ontological, all of those kind of things. And how do we, how do we get to, to be a practical reality that we can live? How can we actually reflect Adventism in a secular um, environment where there's a whole lot of multicultural perspectives. And that's where I want to head to today. We, uh, this afternoon, we, we have identified what secularism is, both within the Western and the Indian, the, um, the Southern Asian context. We have identified who is truth, but we then want to go and say, what can we do? How can we reflect Adventism in this secular environment. And I want to tell you that it comes back to the simple power of storytelling. There is a power in telling stories, and you have a story to tell. Let me tell you about this. Well, first of all, um, if you want to know about the power of stories, just go to the life of Jesus himself. Because, of, Je of course, Jesus was the master storyteller. He would always tell stories. He would start off by saying, the kingdom of God is like, and then he would start telling a story. And every time people were riveted to Jesus, because he was telling a story, telling them something that they, they wanted to listen to. You know, the fact is this is that MRI scans reveal that when we read words like uh, um, uh, perfume um, and coffee or, or um, something something else that, that would be appropriate in an Adventist context. It's interesting that our primary olfactory cortex activates. When we hear those words in our minds, our body starts to respond. Um, individuals who frequently read fiction seem to better understand other people and display greater empathy because they understand the story. They, they're working out how it fits within uh, the, this context. Number three, when, when someone listens to a character-driven story, their brain immediately floods with oxytocin, a love hormone. There, there's something that happens inside of us. We, we're drawn to the story. And um, our brains actually shut down with, with certain types of words and and um, physiologists theorize um, that this is related to storytelling. Um, number five, the hero's journey story model is the foundation for half of all Hollywood movies and the majority of the most watched TED Talks. You can go on YouTube and watch those uh, TED Talks, but it's a story which grabs you. And the number six, the hormone cortisol is released during the rising arc of the story prompting a powerful motion re emotional reaction, even when the listener knows that the story is fiction. Literally, your body responds to, a, to this story. And I don't have to remind you of Bollywood. You know, the fact is, is why is Bollywood so popular? Bollywood in, in, in um, um, India, in your division, uh, Hollywood in America, the fact is this, Bollywood tells stories. Bollywood tells stories. And people are drawn to stories. People will spend thousands, millions of dollars creating stories because people respond to stories. And the fact is this, is that we have a story. We have what we call a history of God's love that we can share with this division. You can share on campus you can share with your classmates, your colleagues, and your lecturers as well. As Fernando Canali uh, wrote, um, a professor for philosophical theology from Andrews University, Adventists have a history or a story to tell the world. The biblical history of God's love is their message. By living this message in everyday life, they become part of God's history of salvation as the eschatological biblical remnant. They're God's visible remnant church because they experience spiritually and proclaim this history to the world. 
This history is a complete harmonious system of biblical truth centered in the historical acts of Christ from before the creation of the world to the unending ages of future eternity. It's amazing, amazing. And I want to just map out this beautiful, beautiful story for you. It goes from eternity past and goes to eternity future as well. Kind of the starting point uh, in the Bible, of course, is creation. Uh, the incredible account of creation. I, I love the story of creation. I keep going back to, to it. Um, but right there in the middle of this story is the cross, the central um, event, the central work of God's love for humanity. As we come down through uh, through history, coming towards our time and, and um, the start of the Adventist church, we have God working towards closure with the pre-Advent judgment, which we find in Daniel chapter 7 and 8 and Revelation uh, 10 and 11 as well. Uh, then we move towards the coming, the second coming of Jesus, um, which is something we're all looking forward to. And then finally we have the completion uh, in Revelation 21 and 22, the completion of God's work of redemption of all creation. Five powerful C's in the story. And there's one unifying theme through this story. There's one unifying person through this story. And you can guess who that is, of course, is Jesus. The Jesus who unifies reality. Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the person who hung on the cross and died for us and rose again. Jesus is the person who is, is currently undertaking the pre-advent judgment uh, depicted in, in Daniel um, 7 and 8. Jesus is coming back. And, of course, it is Jesus who will complete the work of recreation as well. Jesus is at the center and the heart of every stage of this story. And as Revelation 19 says, it is the testimony of Jesus that is the, the spirit of prophecy at the heart of this amazing story. This is a story that you can share. But you might say, well, that's very good. I, I love the five C's, the way I can reflect Adventism to um, the secular environment that I'm in. But I want to start somewhere. I want to start somewhere real. I want to start somewhere now. I want to show, show you that the fact is this is that you have not only God's history of love for humanity, you also have your personal story as well. I want to encourage you to actually write out your personal story, how you have experienced God's salvation story. And it comes in three major parts. Number one, before I met Jesus. Uh, at the center, when I met Jesus, and then after that, after I met Jesus, what changed? Before, when, and after. This is your story to share. You know, um, um, university students, for, for many years, I, I felt I didn't have a, a personal story or a testimony. I remember going to youth rallies, uh, particularly in Christchurch, where, where I would listen to this incredible um, speaker who would tell us about how he... He descended or she descended into um, taking drugs and, and, you know, listening to, to rock and roll and heavy metal, you know, having, um, you know, illicit sex. And then he met Jesus or she met Jesus and, and his or her life changed. I thought, I haven't got a story to share. But the fact is this, that, you know, when I went to Cambridge University, and I was challenged by my atheistic housemate and her friends. I um, discovered I have a story to share. The, the fact is that Jesus has changed my life. He's taken me on a journey. I've experienced God's salvation story. And not only could you, can you share your personal story, your testimony, you can actually be involved in creating contemporary kingdom stories with your friends so that they can experience God's story as, as well. You can do this in Bible study groups. <clears throat> you can do this 
in in small groups where you you eat together and, and you have fun together you build re- relationships the fact is this is that i grew the most spiritually one of the most powerful environments for me to grow spiritually was in a small group with friends that i had in christ church during my university days and and i i could share go on to share um the stories with people in my university um, lectures and and in my research labs as well, so that they too could experience God's salvation story. You know, it's interesting that <clears throat> Jesus actually tells his disciples, <clears throat> gives them direction. He says, "Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you, heal the sick in it, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you." He's saying to them, go out there, enter into campuses and student halls and and, and student flats and and eat with with your housemates, eat with with your classmates. But in that process, you can create a contemporary kingdom story right for them, them there and then. You can heal the sick in it in in, in, uh, the campus where you are you can you can tell them that the kingdom of god has come near to them because uh, of the power of god in their lives and because of that i want to tell you that not only do you have the power of storytelling you also have supernatural power of jesus to add um, to to be called upon to be to be invited by prayer and and seventh adventist students christian students um students listening i want to invite you and challenge you to to call upon the power of jesus call upon his supernatural power to heal diseases to forgive sin and 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 to to remove shame and guilt to restore hope and meaning to people to create a new heart and a new spirit in people I was talking with um, a a Indian church planter down in Sydney um, who was working with Southern Asian um, communities in Sydney. And he shared with me that, you know, when when we're um, reflecting about uh, how to reach Hindus, one of the most important things is to be committed to what he termed power ministry. Because it's not just ideas or philosophy. It's not just the the, the 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 arguments that we can have that will will reflect adventism but it will be the power of jesus at work right where you are you know it's the same with with muslim religions and other religions even even atheism you know when people experience the supernatural power of god in their lives of jesus working a miracle life they will move from being a hindu to being a Christian, they'll move from being a Muslim to a Seventh Day Adventist believer. They'll move from being an atheist to a follower of Jesus Christ. Friends, we need to have faith in the power of Jesus. We need to to pray that and and to have a faith that will move mountains, because Jesus is active. He's alive. He still upholds this universe. He still performs miracles even today. You know, in the very famous book, The Ministry of Healing, which is a great read for university students, particularly medical students and and nursing students, there's an incredible quote, and I just want to share it with you now. The world needs today what it needed 2,000 years ago, a revelation of Jesus Christ. A great work of reform is demanded And it is only through the grace of Christ that the work of restoration, physical, mental, and spiritual can be accomplished. That's the only way that we can reflect uh, Adventism. Uh, And why it goes on to this powerful quote, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people in reflecting Adventism. The Savior mingled with men and women as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them and ministered to their needs and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. And she continues, there is a need of coming close to the people by personal effort. 
If less time were given to sermonizing and more time was spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. The poor are to be relieved, the sick are cared for, the sorrowing and the bereaved comforted, the ignorant instructed, the inexperienced counseled. We are to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. And then Alan White gives us a powerful promise. Accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God, this work will not, cannot be without fruit. University students, lecturers, professors, friends, do you want your life to be with fruit? Do you want your life and witness to be with the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Do you want your reflection of Adventism to be fruitful and successful? The fact is this, when you follow the, the directions of Christ, when you have faith in his supernatural power, when you accompany your reflection with the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God, your reflection will not be without fruit. Keep hold of that promise. Keep hold of that promise. Jesus told uh, some Greek um, people who were searching for him and his disciples, he said, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. You know, the question that we need to ask ourselves this afternoon, the topic of today's presentation is this. How can we reflect Adventism in a secular multicultural community with different multicultural perspectives? And there is just one answer to this question, and that is share the transforming story of Jesus, the history of God's love, your own personal testimony, creating contemporary kingdom stories, allowing the supernatural power of God to be revealed in your life and to be experienced in the lives of those people around you. Let's pray as we finish our seminar this afternoon. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for every university student, for every chaplain, for every lecturer and professor who's joined us this afternoon. Father, I want to thank you for this PCM Congress, which has blessed so many people. Father, I want to pray that you would continue to work your supernatural transforming powers. Father, we recognize that we are in a secular environment where there are many multicultural perspectives. Father, we, we recognize that there are dynamics and movements at play in this world. There's growing secularism in America. There is um, people are losing religion in Australia. There, there is a growing um, challenge to, to the secular state in India. But Father, we know that we are living within the amazing history of your love for humanity. Lord, when we try and reflect on how we can um, uh, reflect Adventism, we come back to that same story. We are to share the history of your love. Father, I pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit. May each and every person be able to say, yes, I have a story to share. May you give them more stories to be able to share and reflect your message. But most of all, Lord, may you work mightily through the power of persuasion, through the power of prayer, through the power of love, that this church in this division will be able to be fruitful for all of eternity is my prayer. May we be able to reflect your love and your, me your, your message to the world in which we live is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, sir, for the wonderful 
seminar that has been taken up right now. At this time, we'll have Pastor Kiro Dalapati to come and offer for us the closing prayer. Shall you all stand for prayer? Father in heaven, we'd like to thank you, Lord, for these beautiful moments. We'd like to thank you for these PCM meetings, Lord, and the beautiful message which we have received from your servants and all the panel discussions we had, Lord. We would like to submit the ones, those who are leading us in our churches, Lord. Also, we'd like to submit the administrative bodies in our institutions. We are living in the last days. We need your later rain upon each one of us to prepare ourselves and others for your coming kingdom. As the leaders have taken a challenge to teach and bring the young ones, those who are studying in other institutes and colleges, unto your feet, Lord. Let your spirit be endured upon them. Lord, speak to them. Lead them, guide them to be ambassadors for thee wherever they are, Lord. Let them be a shining light and a salt which will be seasoned and they will be bringing many more souls to your feet. Lord, we'd like to thank you once again for this blessed hours which you have given us. We'd like to pray for the ones, those who are present in the meeting, anyone sick amongst us, Lord, touch your healing mighty hands and heal them, bring them back to normal health and condition. Anyone is suffering with any kind of spiritual, mental, and physical illness, Lord, be with very close to them, fulfill the desires of their heart. We also would like to pray for those, those who are unable to come, Bless them too and bless their families also. We are coming uh, to the sundown and we will be welcoming a blessed Sabbath where we could come to your presence and spend these holy hours, Lord. We would like to pray for your angels upon this campus as we move around on the Sabbath day. May we feel the presence of your angels and you amongst us with these blessings, Lord, Send us away from here and bring us back in the evening hours to sing praises unto you. For we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We would like to thank each and every one of you who have been part of this session online as well as offline. And I hope that each and every one of you will join us again for our Vesper service that's been conducted here, right here in this house of prayer at 7 p.m. today. And we hope and pray that each and every one of you will be part of the Vesper service and even part of the Sabbath school that takes place tomorrow morning at 9. Thank you and have a happy Sabbath.